name's Holly. I was a writer and editor, living vicariously. I'm in the country that's home to an astonishing one billion people. This is Agadez, a strategic point on the Trans-Saharan trade routes and the holy city of the warrior tribe, the Tuareg. Who knew that a crack in the economic deadlock between the U.S. and Iran would all be due to a little tiny egg? The caviar trade is our closest relationship to Iran right now. I looked at fear, renamed it potential, and dreamt up a girl world pilgrimage to travel the globe and find my own icons. This is the place where the 444 day siege happened in 1979. We're not supposed to be filming, um, so we're doing so very quickly. We should go faster. Zanan magazine, which means women in Farsi, rides a dangerous wave of feminism and politics. There's been a bit of a press crackdown lately here, hasn't there? Yes, many publications were forced to shut down last year, but new ones were published in their place. How do you survive in this? atmosphere. I mean, it's hard enough to publish a magazine anywhere. Journalism in developing countries is like walking on a high rope. It requires a tremendous balancing act. Zanan's survival is a testimony to Sherkat's ability to toe the line and move it at the same time. Feels like it's someone's revolution. Beauty parlors are one of the few public places where women can be unveiled. So they come in, the veils come off, and the works get done. I've been uh, welcomed in with a little camera and a lot of discretion. I can't show any faces. Tamine Milani has a reputation for being tenacious, forthright, and fun. <laughs> By making that movie, we say that as long as you remain silent and don't say anything, your problems will remain. Speak up and pay the price for it, and, and it may transform and change your life. A month after we met Tahmine, she was arrested and put in prison. They said the hidden half was sympathetic to counter-revolutionary groups. Three weeks later, with the support of the artistic community and factions of the reformist government, she was released on bail. She awaits trial. I'm um, finding myself a little bit nervous because in the briefing, they went over that shark at Barracuda bit really, really quickly. I don't know what that means. <laughs> they say about fear of heights, it's actually not that you're, you fear falling, it's that you fear you don't trust yourself not to jump. Oh, Here we are, top of the mother horn. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for my potty mouth. It was, uh, either, it was either curse or cry. <laughs> my government says I'm not supposed to come here, which made me want to come all the more. But now all I can think of is, there's no American embassy. It's really interesting, though, the way they're treated differently in this culture. I mean, Che is dead and mythologized and will never change. But Fidel is alive and growing old and dealing with a failing economy. 
and in conversations I've had both on and off camera, you really get the sense that there's a new generation coming along and maybe they want some change. It's not dismissing everything about the old, but definitely wanting some new. I am what strikes me is all the paradox. I mean, this is a communist country, but uh, there's mushrooming capitalism and entrepreneurialism practically everywhere you look. And um, we're Americans, but it's technically illegal to spend American dollars here. And we're surrounded by water, but nobody eats fish. I mean, it's kind of strange. It seems like a place where pastoral conservatism meets twisted brilliance, where biculturalism is a verb, and it's all run by strappy Sheilas. Cool to be Molly. <laughs> it's no secret that the ladies run New Zealand. There's the Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition, mayor of all the major cities, attorney general. But what I'm wondering is what kind of socio-political stars align to create this reality. What's your hope for, let's say, 15 years down the line, New Zealand, that you would like to see? 15 years down the track, I'd like to see New Zealanders a lot more confident about their country. New Zealand's had a lot of people who've knocked it, uh, mainly New Zealanders. There is a bit of a tall poppy syndrome here, but in a way it's been the tall poppies who've been talking the country down. I don't know what the tall poppy... I don't know that. Oh, tall, tall poppies uh, refers to people who do well uh, getting knocked off their perch. Oh, and that's okay. been a bit of a feature of New Zealand society. Aside from the Nepalese, it's the Tibetan people who make up the biggest part of the population in Darjeeling, about 20%. Most of them are living in exile because they fled Tibet in 1959 when the Chinese invaded. Well, India has reasons to be both happy and angry. What are they? Happy, they settle with themselves, they're contented people, well, by and large. Why? Why? Genetically. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's not the 330 million deities? I think every Indian has a habit of looking for an anchor. What is their anchor? Anchor could be a, a deity, it could be a god, it could be a church, it could be a guru, it could be an exercise, it could be yoga. You started this by saying there's a lot to be happy about and a lot to be miserable about. There is an anxiety in every Indian. How do we get better governance, better enforcement of laws, better justice, um, greater prosperity, more employment? India remains a mysterious tapestry of nods and subtleties, suffering and passion. As travelers, we don't have a prayer of finding the real India. That's why we're always trying to find ourselves. But moving through this spiritual cauldron has taught me that tragedy and contentment are closer bedfellows than we might imagine.